Everybody, thank you for joining us today. My name is Suha Soydan. Uh, I work at Özgün University Center for Entrepreneurship as the Entrepreneurship Support Programs Manager. Uh, today, to celebrate the Global Entrepreneurship Week, we are hosting uh, Mr. Lawrence Merritt, who is the CEO and co-founder of Vavacars. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of Vavacars uh, and its operations in Turkey. Uh, and we are running this uh, event uh, with generous support from the <coughs> EIT. Uh, we are running a project for our international students and startups uh, by uh, funding provided by the European Inst Inno uh, Institute of Innovation and Technology. And this is the end ending event uh, of our series for the Global Entrepreneurship Week. It is a really a real pleasure for us to be having you here and also Mr. Lawrence Merritt. Taking your time, uh, I know you have a really, really busy schedule and uh, this is the very first time you have been on this part of Istanbul. <laughs> so can you please first uh, tell us about yourself? Who is Lawrence? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, can I do merhaba everyone? It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Who here has heard of Avakas, by the way? Yeah. A few people. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, so yeah, my name is Lawrence. I, I'm the co-founder. I'm the CEO of Avacars. Um, this is a company that uh, we created almost four years ago in, in Turkey. Um, my background is that I'm the, I'm the son of immigrants. My, my mother is from Pakistan. My, my father is from Hong Kong. Uh, I was uh, raised and I went to school in London. Uh, I pretty much spent most of my early working career in London. I then had the uh, opportunity to work in San Francisco when I was at Yahoo. Uh, so I'm kind of um, very international, I guess, in my perspective and, and outlook. Uh, I've had lots of um, relevant experience to what you guys are studying. I guess that's why I'm here. So um, I've always tried to work in future focused future-facing industries, emerging industries. That's really my background. So it's all about consumer internet. It's all about consumer technology. Um, I've worked in some of the biggest um, technology companies. I've worked at Microsoft, at Yahoo, uh, at Amazon, at Amazon Web Services. Um, but I've also um, built things from a very early stage. I've co-founded three companies. This is now my third company. So I hope I will have relevant experience and relevant perspectives uh, to, share with, to share with my audience here today. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for giving me some time. Thank you, thank you so much. So you had so many experience in a variety of sectors, but what was your first job and how did you pick that one? My first job, wow. Um, <laughs> I was a waiter in Pizza Hut. That was my first uh, job. Uh, I got fired actually for being a waiter in Pizza <laughs> Hut. That was my first failure. I wasn't able to hold that job down. Um, so I was at school. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but I was a terrible student. Um, I was really not very successful at school. I didn't do very well at all. My grades were terrible. Um, and my parents were you know, determined for me to go on to university and become respectable. Um, but I just didn't enjoy it. And I took a year out. Uh, I met a girl. You know how that story goes. <laughs> and um, within six months, we were expecting our first child. Um, it wasn't planned. So um, I had to get out into the world and work. Uh, luckily enough, I was able to fall into technology. Uh, I can't say that it was my dream as a child growing up. None of this was planned. None of this was programmed. Um, but uh, I felt that I was good with people. I felt that I was good at talking. My, my colleagues will tell you, boy, he can talk a lot. Um, and so I found a job in sales and in this emerging industry called advertising sales and on this emerging thing called the internet. Um, so uh, that was really my first proper job. I was, I was walking the streets of London, visiting advertising agencies, trying to sell them this thing called banner advertising, which had just emerged in the kind of mid 1990s that that was my that was my first proper job okay great so uh, after your first proper job you generally took responsibilities in relation to business development new market entry starting from scratch uh -huh. so when you think all about those experiences uh, can you share some insights about 
uh, those responsibilities and what did they teach you and how did they prepare you to your current case? Yeah, I think my advice um, to anyone that's starting out is try and establish a broad base of perspectives, experiences, and expertise. Try and do that. That was the strategy or that was the plan that I followed. I wanted to learn about sales. I, I wanted to learn about marketing, product management, uh, leading teams, technology, finance, business development. I tried to expose myself to each of those functions. And so if you look at the history of my career, it looks like it follows a narrative. I don't quite know how it how I managed to achieve that, but that's what happened. So, so I began in advertising sales. I then went to this company called Expedia, which was trying to reinvent travel by embracing this thing called the internet. And at Expedia, I learned all about business development and I learned all about online marketing. Uh, we were one of the very first advertisers in, in the world to embrace Google. I remember buying ads on Google. Uh, back in those days, 1999, 2000, we were you know, buying ads through an online interface and, and paying a CPM. It was not a click-based model. Uh, I then was able to double down on my marketing experience and expertise by going to Yahoo. I don't know if anybody in this audience is uh, young enough to remember <laughs> Yahoo or yeah, knows do, Yahoo. Do, yeah. Are there any yeah. Yahoo people out there? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I was at Yahoo when Yahoo was still relevant. Uh, this was 2004-2008 time. I became European Marketing Director at Yahoo. And so after assimilating these different experiences, I felt I was equipped to go into general management. And that's when I embraced startup life, startup culture. So my, my, advice, to, my advice to the people in the audience is that that's one way expose yourself to lots of different experiences, different perspectives, different industries, different backgrounds. And that then equips you really well um, to face the challenges of creating your own business. Because when you create your own business, you have to be a little bit expert in many diverse areas, many diverse categories. My second advice uh, to the audience sitting in this room is uh, be very comfortable with failure. Be very comfortable with trying something and failing. Be very comfortable with um, uh, doing something and not, and not succeeding. Again, as I, as I look back uh, over my developmental parts were not when I succeeded, but when I failed. Uh, and I'm talking about this in particular because I know culturally that's difficult for people as a concept to embrace. It's very, very difficult. It's not just difficult in Istanbul as a concept to embrace failure. It's difficult in London as a concept to embrace failure. I think a lot of the success that uh, the mythical Silicon Valley enjoys is that culturally people are very comfortable with failing. They don't have a problem with failing. They run into their failure, failures. They embrace their failures. They wear failure as a badge of honor. It's something that people are very comfortable and open talking about. Uh, and I have failed extensively in my career. My career is not one of one success after another. Um, unfortunately, that's a fairy tale. That's not real life. Sure. Uh, and so I think the other thing that I would say to you is develop a broad base of perspectives, but also be very comfortable with trying something and failing at it because I'm 99% certain in saying to you that when you fail, you will learn the most. That will define you more than any success you enjoy in your career. And in order to be eventually successful, you have to have failed. There is no individual in this world that has just enjoyed success and nothing but success, or those individuals are certainly exceptional. They are not the norm. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for these inspiring points. Uh, and as you were climbing up the corporate ladder, you also partnership in the corporate con context. Uh, you were the managing director of group incubator at Photobox company. Yeah. So uh, what was this role about and how was it to try being innovative or entrepreneurial in a corporate context? Yeah, so Photobox um, uh, was a startup and, and I joined Photobox at a very, very early stage. 
I think less than 20 or 30 people and, uh, and eventually I replaced one of the co-founders, I became managing director. So the people at Photobox probably would not enjoy being described as a corporate. <laughs> um, we were very much a startup. Uh, that, that's another big difference culturally. It's something maybe we can touch on. Sure. The word corporate, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of uh, seen as a positive thing in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, it's not seen as a positive thing. Um, and culturally, convert those photos into real physical products. So we would print your photos for you, they would arrive on your doormat the next day, or you could put your photos into a photo book or put them on a canvas or put them on wall art. So it was a category that didn't previously exist. In you may recall there were some very famous U-turns. Microsoft famously embraced mobile. Facebook was increasingly paranoid about this thing called mobile. That was actually a large part of why they bought Instagram, because they felt that the desktop experience of Facebook was potentially being cannibalized by the mobile-first experience of Instagram. So many technology companies at that time were finding it very difficult to pivot and to embrace this new platform. And that's the history of technology, by the way. There's always a new platform. The people at Facebook or the people at Meta would tell you that that's actually what they're now trying to do, hence the rebranding to Meta and the two. Platforms change, and in 2010, 2011, we were uh, uh, not exiting the desktop platform, but we were seeing the emergence of the mobile platform. What, 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 what also happens is that technology teams, product people, they find it very difficult to embrace the next new platform. And so we were finding it very difficult in our organization for the desktop people, let's say, to embrace the next new platform that was mobile. And so we felt, like a lot of companies at the time, that instead of trying to get the existing team to embrace this new thing, let's create a new team focused specifically on be becoming a mobile-first offering. And so that's really what the mission of the incubator, bo incubator was. So my job was to say, okay, we do all of these things on desktop, let's now go mobile. was really the context. Companies find it difficult sometimes letting go of what they know and embracing what is new. And that's often true of startups, not just corporates. Okay. So you had this entrepreneurship experience in a way in this uh, setting as yeah. a, a director of the group incubator. And then you decided to pursue a new role in a maybe more early stage startup, which is TechSmart. Yes. And uh, you already mentioned that you have been always uh, open to new opportunities, new markets and emerging technologies. And uh, TechSmart aimed at resolve authenticity in art. Yes. So this is a totally different domain than the ones you have been involved back then. So how did you pick that role in TechSmart and how did it how did the story go? Yeah, so TechSmart's uh, our mission was very simple. We, we, we wanted to try and address the problem of fakes and forgeries in the art world. That was our mission. Um, so um, quite a bold ambition, quite a bold mission, lofty in many ways. Um, um, and, and I came to that because I had some friends that were artists. They were 
they were artists, and they always used to complain to me about seeing their works on eBay that were fakes and forgeries. Um, so that's the essence, that's the origin story really of Taxman. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd done my thing at Photobox, I'd had my experience at Photobox, and um, thankfully we had enjoyed a very successful exit at Photobox. And so I was looking for something a bit more entrepreneurial, something a bit more startup-y to go and do. Photobox by that stage had become quite a large company. And so this, this sentiment, this, this, this expression that had always been shared with me, that the art world is plagued by fakes and forgeries, felt like a great problem statement. Um, and I think if you're starting a, you know, starting a startup, this would be my, my, my next piece of advice to the audience in this room, is be really clear about the problem statement. Start with the problem statement. If you can't summarize the problem statement to your mom in plain English, there's a problem with your problem statement. <laughs> you know, you really should be so clear and so defined in, in, in your problem statement. What is it that you're trying to solve? What is it that you're trying to do better? Um, so that's what, that's what our problem statement was. Um, the challenge with TagSmart uh, was, and here's, my, here's, here's another piece of advice, the challenge was that we then created a category of product that nobody was used to buying. No artist was buying a product or a service to provide authenticity. No gallery was buying a product or a service. No art buyer was buying specifically a product or a service that guaranteed them authenticity. So we created a product category that did not previously exist. That was the challenge. So we, we, we developed some really clever technology. We're going to give artists this fancy tag. They're going to put it onto the back of their work. The tag is going to link to a blockchain. The blockchain will have the provenance of every single piece of art. Its entire history from the day it was created, every time there's a change of ownership, it's captured in the blockchain, every time there's a transfer, every time there's a transaction, it's captured in the blockchain. But the art world hated it. <laughs> that was the problem. They hated it. They hated this. They hated it for two reasons. First of all, we were asking them to pay for something that nobody was used to buying. And the second reason the art world hated it is because they did not want openness, they did not want transparency. Um, don't always assume that industry incumbents want openness, want transparency. They don't. They may have a vested interest in keeping things the way that they are. They may have a vested interest in being able to sell fine pieces of arts in a gallery for $100,000 that they may be purchased three weeks ago for $50,000. They don't want you to know. So I think those were our mistakes. Our mistakes were, okay, this is a great problem statement. Okay, we have a fantastic technology to address this problem statement. But what we did not consider, and what I'm asking you to consider if you ever create a startup, is am I asking people to do something that they've never done? And will they do it? And why will they do it? Those were our mistakes. We were asking people to buy a product or a service that they had never bought before. They had never done this before. I mean, you know, Uber, I was looking for an Uber this morning. Uber in many ways is a very innovative company, but it's a better way to do something that people have done for many years, ordering a taxi, right? What we were trying to do was ask people to buy a product or service that they had never done before. So who's going to pay for this? And the second thing, why will they do it? Do they have a vested interest in doing this? Or do they have a vested interest in not doing this? The art world had a vested interest in not doing this. And so for those reasons, it was the biggest failing of my career. We completely, we completely failed. I mean, I tried it for almost two and a half, three years. I put money into it, I bootstrapped it, we, you know, <clears throat> raised a few million pounds in angel investing, but it completely failed. And those are two, 
two of the big reasons why it failed. And so I learned a lot from that, a bit like I was saying to you before. You learn the most when you fail. You learn very little, unfortunately, when you succeed. And I learned a lot from that experience by failing as spectacularly as we did. And a lot of my failings then informed what I chose to do after that experience. Thank you. Uh, and now it is very clear that why you started Vava Cars. Because with Vava Cars, there is this very solid problem. People are buying and selling cars, and there are things that are not going well. <coughs> So with your TechSmart uh, experience, I'm sure uh, you, are, you felt much more comfortable in entering this kind of a market because the problem <coughs> is there, customer is there. So you mm -hmm. thought that there, this will be much easier, I guess. Uh, and, but how did you come up with the idea? So you were dealing in the, uh, with the art industry and prior to that digital advertising and online printing services, on-demand services. So how did you end up with used car sales? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I love embracing you know, um, new industries and moving into new vertical industries. Um, uh, I, I've always been very, very curious about the world. I've always been very curious about people, very curious about um, different categories. So some people will choose to stay in the same industry for their entire professional career. and. I think that's very valid uh, and worthy, and, and, and there are some people like me that just can't do that. Um, so, so I do have experience of different verticals, different industries. I think I see that as an advantage. I was describing that at the start. Um, um, uh, and, and it suits me, it has suited me, because I love to disrupt, uh, because I love to look at the status quo. I love to look at the orthodoxy of a given industry and to say, hold on a minute, Maybe there's a way of doing this so much better. So, so I would say that that's, that's really the theme of my career, and that's why I've had many different experiences in many different verticals in many different industries. And so if you look at my career through that narrative, creating a used car business in Turkey kind of makes sense. <laughs> it's not unusual. It's actually an extrapolation of the historical trend line. Um, so for me, it makes perfect sense. It's just another industry, a huge industry, a huge opportunity. As you've said, a very clear problem statement. Um, people that buy and sell cars do so with a lot of insecurity, with a lot of anxiety. Uh, everybody expects to get ripped off. Uh, nobody expects it to be a smooth or an enjoyable experience. Um, and so uh, that made it a very, very attractive industry for me. And the reason why Turkey really appealed is because, um, A, on a personal level, I wanted to do something outside of the UK, outside of, let's say, Europe. Um, Europe has many advantages, but there are some disadvantages in Europe. Uh, I'd never really created a business outside of Europe, so I was curious to do that. Um, but I was also really drawn to Turkey and, let's say, emerging markets, frontier markets, because of the dynamism, because of the youth, because of the energy. Europe is old. <laughs> Europe is old. You know, Europe has a real demographic problem. It's full of really old people. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and, um, and I feel more energy. I feel, I mean, let's talk about Turkey. The median age of the population in Turkey is 32. Uh, everybody in Turkey uh, is so comfortable in embracing technology, the engagement and the consumption of technology in Turkey is amongst the highest in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, but your penetration of things like Google, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, it's amongst the highest in the world. That, that also made Turkey very, very attractive. The people here love change. They are happy to embrace change, particularly technology-driven change. Um, that's another very, very attractive feature. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the used car market in Turkey is enormous. You know, it's one of the largest markets in the world. It's one of the largest markets in Europe, mm -hmm. after the UK, France, Germany, maybe Italy, but Turkey. Um, and so that also made it very attractive. And Turkey is very easy to overlook. So if you're an international investor or if you're trying to create a business, Turkey is very easy to overlook because people get anxious or insecure about the, geopolit the geopolitical stability, shall we say, 
And so therefore, it's very easy for investors to overlook a market like Turkey. But given those fundamentals that I described, there is enormous opportunity here. So I embrace the used car industry because for me, it's just another industry. It's one of the largest in the world that is almost entirely offline. Yeah. You know, it kind of felt like Amazon, it's 1994, and they've just started selling books. The used car industry looked a lot like that to me. Uh, it's almost entirely offline. It's an industry that really hasn't changed in 50 years. The way to sell a car, the way to buy a car has not changed in over 50 years. So I felt that it, I felt as an industry it was ripe for innovation, for disruption, for someone to champion the consumer, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And the Turkey market appealed to me for the reasons that I've described. Um, so it was a brilliant combination of those two things and I'm so excited and so thrilled to have done this. We're four years into the journey and I feel in our own small way we're really making a dent. Great, thank you for the market insights as well. Uh, and uh, back to the beginning of the story, you had a co-founder, right? Yes. Uh, and how did you come together? Because uh, for the first phases of a startup, the founding team, co-founders are key, and your first team members, getting them <laughs> on board and creating a culture of the company is really important. So how did you handle those issues and definitely how did you find your co-founder? Yeah, it's a great question. I do have a, I have a tremendous co-founder. Her name is Elise. Um, she's been with me on this journey from the very, very beginning. Uh, and we complement each other phenomenally well. My advice to, you know, again, you, if, 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 the, if, if anyone here is thinking about doing something, creating a team, establishing that first team, my, my advice is, is very, very simple. Look for differences. Look for differences. Don't hire someone that is in your own image. Don't work with someone that is a carbon copy of you. There's no value in that. Don't look for duplication. Look for someone that is accretive. Don't look for someone that has the same skill set, the same perspectives, the same experience, the same technical experience as you. That's duplication. Look for someone that complements you entirely. So look for diversity. I'm thrilled because Elise is a woman, I'm a man. <laughs> so we have gender diversity. Elise has a very strong finance background. That's not my background. So we are very complementary. We are diverse in that sense. You should always seek diversity in the founding team. That would be my advice. In terms of experiences and skills, <clears throat> and then commonality in the founding team on mission and values. The only bit where they are both really excited about this mission for whatever reason, and do we share the same values? Do we have the same personal culture? Culture is so critical to the success of a startup. There has to be alignment in the founding team on those two things. Never compromise on mission fit and culture fit. Outside of that, look for diversity. Look for people that are not like you, that are the opposite of you. You will find strength in that diversity. I think to the extent that Elise and I have been successful, it's because of those things. We're very diverse, but we are also completely aligned on mission and culture. And I would say that's really been my approach to the leadership team that we have at Vava Cars. Um, it fits that format, it, it's designed in that way. That, that would really be my, my advice to anyone here thinking about doing this. Okay, great. So you started in London, but then immediately expanded in, into Turkey <coughs> and you created a new team in Turkey from scratch. Yes. So how did you find your initial team members? You definitely had a track record, but you generally been around in UK or in USA. So you did not have much connections maybe with Turkey or with the local players or with the local professional network. So how did you find those right people to get from start? 
Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I was in London. I was living in uh, I'm working in in London. My family is in London. Elise Elise was in London as well. Um, so we we didn't really know anyone here. We had this big advantage though, that we had a we formed a strategic partnership with Petro Lafisi. Uh, so so instead of just coming cold into a new market where we don't know anyone, I literally didn't know anyone uh, here in Turkey. Uh, we felt that this was something that could really help us. And so one of the advantages of us being funded by um, the investor that created Vava Cars was that that investor, that company, uh, owns Petrol Efisi. Uh, and we felt that that was of strategic value and of real importance to us because at least we had a ramp, at least we had a bridge to enter Istanbul, to enter Turkey. So when I started to... Um, fly to Istanbul. You know, I started, I started my role at Vavakaz in June 2018. In July, I was on a plane coming to Istanbul every week. Thankfully, I wasn't just walking the streets and having nowhere to go. I would go to the Petrol Efisi office. So they were my onboard, they were my ramp into the market, and they were able to provide assistance, guidance, a connection of ne a network of connections, uh, and so that was invaluable. So, so I think if someone was trying to do something in another market, having a local partner that you can bounce off, that can serve you and work with you in that way, is is of real importance because it just reduces your time to learn because you have someone or you have a group of people that you're able to talk with every single day. That was invaluable. Um, Is, hey, you know, do you want to become a used car salesman? You know, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. So I was chasing all of the general managers of all of the big auto industries, and I was messaging a lot of those people on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I, you know, met a headhunter. I appointed a headhunter and got him to help me. And then there were the, again, I used this term, the network of connections. So friends colleagues doing referrals and recommendations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So really the hiring was about those three things, going direct, appointing a good partner, and then trying to access the referrals and the recommendations of the small group of people that you may know. That was really how we did it. And it was a lot of success and a lot of failure. It was a lot of testing and it was a lot of iteration. The thing that I would say that I think might be of interest and a little bit controversial is that be comfortable failing when you hire. It's okay to fail when you hire. Just fail fast. It's okay to hire people and very, very quickly within three months say, do you know what, this just doesn't work, and let them go. It's okay for them and it's okay for you. It's the best thing for them and it's actually the best thing for you. Do it in a way that is respectful. Do it, in a, do it in a way that is consistent with who you are and whatever values you represent. But do it. Don't not do it. Not doing it will kill you. Sure. I can tell you that. So uh, I was very comfortable hiring people and assessing those people for mission fit and culture fit and if they did not fit, we let them go. We let them go very, very quickly. And I know that, you know, it used to trouble many of my colleagues here. It used to <laughs> trouble my colleagues at Petrol Efisi. used to trouble, you know, my colleagues on the team. It was like, wow, Lawrence, you know, your churn is so high. Churn is a positive thing when you start a company because you will never recruit your dream team from the word go. Stop thinking that you will ever do that. You will not do that. You have to be comfortable with churn. Yes, you can invest a lot in the hiring process. Believe me, we have the most extensive hiring process 
today as we did four years ago. But in the end, you are never, you are never for sure. You are never for sure because hiring, however you try to codify it, however you try to break it down into an objective and scientific process, in the end, it is still a judgment. In the end, it is still subjective. And so therefore, it's not a binary thing. It's not a one or a zero. You will never know. And so in the end, you will only ever know by working with people and be comfortable be comfortable letting the people that don't fit go. It's okay. Culturally, I think that was also very challenging for my colleagues in Turkey. This concept that you can fail, but you should fail fast. Just don't take a year to fail if someone doesn't fit. Great. So, do you have a question? Yes, I have three questions. Can I ask? I don't want to take time. Uh, yeah, we, if yeah, just one of the questions, please, and then we will continue. Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, how many uh, you have been gone? Uh, you have how many you have been gone in marketing? That's okay. Could you? Yes. Which company you have uh, was ro working? Which company you, have, you was working? Which company was I working yeah. for when I was in marketing? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I began my marketing career at Expedia. Uh, does, I'm not sure if Expedia is very well known in Turkey. Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah. So Expedia had just launched. It was 1999, and I was transitioning from advertising sales to marketing. And so I began my marketing career. Um, I'm not sure people would describe me as a marketer, but <laughs> I did marketing uh, for five or six years. And then from Expedia, I, I, was, I was in marketing at Yahoo in 2004 to, to 2008. That, that was my marketing experience. So we will have the remaining questions okay. at the end. Okay, thanks so much. So uh, after starting in Turkey and creating this dream team of yours, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> our first team, yeah. uh, you also decided to go to a new market, yes. to Pakistan. Yes. You already mentioned the dynamics for Turkish market and your motivations for starting in Turkey. Yeah. But did you have the same motivations in Pakistan and did it play well or how did it end? Yeah, I mean, we failed in Pakistan. Uh, so, so let me begin by, by starting <laughs> at the end. Unfortunately, we failed in Pakistan. But the motivation to launch in Pakistan was very consistent with the motivation to launch in Turkey. The problem statement was very clear. The mission was very clear. So a lot of insecurity, a lot of anxiety for consumers in Pakistan buying and selling used cars. Everybody, expect, everybody expected to be ripped off. An industry that was devoid of any standards, an industry that was devoid of um, a real consumer champion. So, so the motivation was the same. From a market perspective, a lot of commonality with Turkey. Uh, so the seventh most populous country in the world and a median age of 21. Embracing this thing called the internet, embracing technology, embracing change. Um, so a lot of similarities. Uh, like Turkey, um, the uh, market is closed for imports. One of the reasons why the used car market is so valuable in Turkey is because there are no imports. Uh, and you have high taxation on new cars. Exactly the same in Pakistan very high taxation on new cars, closed for used cars. Um, and like Turkey, a lot of the reason why people would buy used cars as, was as a hedge against inflation. So people buy used cars in Turkey, not just for mobility, but because it's a way for you to protect against inflation and protect against FX depreciation. People buy cars in Turkey a bit like they buy gold, a bit like they buy foreign exchange, a bit like they buy Bitcoin. The same in Pakistan. So when we were doing our scan, we saw all of these commonalities. And we felt that, OK, given all of these commonalities, everything that we're building in Turkey could be exported into this market, Pakistan. Three months after we launched, the COVID pandemic struck. <laughs> and the markets began to close down. And then after two years of COVID, there was all of this geopolitical flux. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, there's a lot of instability there right now, given political turmoil, political changes. 
Um, so for those reasons, we felt that, hold on, this is going to be very, very challenging. It's going to take us a long time or longer than we had anticipated. The other reason, just to be really open and honest with this audience, is that the financial world had changed. In November last year, you know, this guy, Jerome Powell, someone that every startup co-founder needs to track, believe me. The chairman of the Federal Reserve is relevant to all of you. He is very relevant to every single person that creates a company in the world today. Uh, and this guy, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, in November decided to call time on inflation and started to raise rates. When interest rates start to rise, the opportunity cost of venture funding rises as well. What the hell does that mean? It means that it becomes very difficult for any startup in the world to raise money. It becomes very difficult in a high interest rate environment for you to raise money. What that then means is that if you are a startup in the world, you better get to break even fast because you are going to find it very difficult to raise money on terms that are acceptable to you. So there's this thing called dilution. Every time you raise money, you pay a price. You give away a chunk of your company. So in this financial environment of high inflation, high interest, it becomes very difficult to raise money if you are not break even. You can no longer be a startup that is just focused on growth. Yeah. You have to become a startup that delivers growth but is also break even or has a very clear path to break even and profitability. So the fusion of those factors, some to do with Pakistan, some to do with the changing financial environment and the requirement therefore on us to become break even, to become free cash flow positive quickly drew us to this conclusion, this sad and regrettable conclusion that actually we have to exit Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Now is no longer the right time for us to be there because the journey to break even will be a multi-year journey. And so the opportunity cost of spending those dollars in Pakistan becomes enormous. And we decided to consolidate on our operations here with a view to becoming break even and free cash flow positive here within the next few months. Um, so that's why we went, but that's also why, unfortunately, with great regret, we had to exit and shut down our operation in Pakistan. Thank you so much. So back to Turkey. You already mentioned that Turkish people buy and sell cars for different motivations, not just for mobility, but as a hedge against inflation and yes. other motives. So did you have any interesting cases or stories as you expand in Turkish market, as you have more customers in there? Uh, did you have those fun moments or maybe sometimes sad moments, uh, if you can share? That would be great. <clears throat> I would say that consumers have generally embraced the service. Consumers have embraced the service. Um, so we're thrilled by our progress. We, we're the fastest growing startup in Turkey ever. Um, we're the fastest uh, growing company in Turkey ever. Um, in the first six months of this year, which is our third full year of trading, we did over $500 million in revenue. No one has ever done that in Turkey. No one ever. Uh, and so that success uh, is a byproduct of consumer acceptance and consumer adoption. Uh, and so I'm thrilled uh, and really excited and very happy about the rate at which consumers in Turkey have embraced Vava cars. And I think they have embraced us because, you know, we have really focused on delivering on our mission, which is, look, we just think that it should be easy and hassle-free for anyone to be able to buy or sell a car. And so we've done a good job so far in delivering on that. Uh, we've converted, let's say, what was a negative net promoter score experience. I'm not sure if the students here are familiar with NPS as a concept. Might be. Net promoter score, it's you know, one of the most important metrics by which to measure your business. It's the extent to which people will refer and recommend you. So it's your promoters divided by your detractors. 
So if someone buys a product or service from you, ask them, how likely are you to recommend you to a friend or family? If they score on a scale of 0 to 10 above 8, they're a promoter. Very, very important. One of the single most important aspects of your business if you start a business that you have to manage is your word of mouth. You have to manage your word of mouth. You have to create user love for your product or service. The first 20 customers that you serve must love it. The first 50 customers that you serve must love what you are doing. Only once you have a small critical mass of consumers that love whatever it is you are doing, do you have a chance of succeeding. Find the love and then scale it. Don't try and scale too quickly. <laughs> Just do what it takes to find a product or service, to create a product or service that people love. And so we call this our net promoter score. Our NPS for when we are selling a car is high 80s. That's unprecedented. That means that people that buy a car from us really love the experience and they tell everybody about it. Um, so I would say that the consumer acceptance has been very, very positive. Right. I would say the challenge in, in Turkey isn't really to do with the consumer side. The challenge in Turkey is to do with, let's say, Other places. the regulatory environment. It's actually a regulatory challenge um, because it's very, very volatile. You know, it's very, very volatile. Um, uh, new regulations are introduced frequently. Um, the OVT has just been announced as something yeah. that will change on December the 1st. Uh, the leader of the opposition uh, released a video on Instagram in July saying, do not buy cars. You know, there are lots of regulatory challenges, shall we say, that suddenly change your world overnight. Change your world overnight, you know? Uh, I think I was at a basketball game in June uh, because Alhamdulillah, thankfully, you know, Vavakar sponsors the Super League. I was at a match. I was watching uh, uh, FS against Fenerbahce in the playoffs. And, you know, a minister announced um, the Lira deposit scheme, KKM. It was kind of announced, you know, overnight. And that had a huge impact on FX. That had a huge impact on currency, oh, sure. which then also has a huge impact on things like used car prices. So this is not a criticism in any way. I'm just saying that in this environment, the challenge is regulatory. If you are entering, uh, uh, if you're creating a business, don't ever underestimate yeah. the regulatory side. You have to understand the regulatory environment that you are entering in a market like Turkey and emerging in developing markets like Turkey where the stability on the regulatory very carefully as well. From a competitor standpoint, yeah, everybody, I think I'm going to pick up on what you've said. Everybody has followed. Many, many people have followed. So Vava Cars now has many, many competitors that are I don't mean to sound disparaging, uh, but they are me too, you know? They kind of looked at what we do and they are very much attempting to copy. Though what I would say is that we still retain many unique advantages for consumers. I'll give you one. We're really the only service in Turkey that sells a car online. We're the only ones that will sell you a car fully online. And deliver it. And one. deliver it to your door. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting, and actually I'm really happy about it, I hope our competitors don't see this. <laughs> uh, what's interesting, but also something that I'm very, very happy about, is that all of the people that have entered our space, that are now trying to compete with us, they continue with the showroom model. If you want to buy a car from any of our competitors, whoever they may be, you have to phone them up. And they say, come and visit the car in my gallery or in my showroom. You go and see the car in the showroom. You have to take time out of your day. You know, you have to take your family with you. You have to view the car. You have to deal with a salesman. Who here, deal you, who here enjoys dealing with salespeople? Anyone? You, you have to negotiate. You have to haggle. You still have to do all of those things. Sure. 
we choose to do something completely different. I prefer software to showrooms. I prefer to sell my cars through software, not through showrooms. So I hope that this is an advantage that we maintain for a very, very long time. Maybe it's to do with what I was you know, describing earlier. When you're in an existing industry, it's very, very difficult to sometimes let go and to forget how you have got to where you have arrived. It's very, very difficult to let go of that. That can also be an advantage when you're looking to disrupt or out-innovate an existing player. An existing player, for sure, knows the most about the past. They do not know the most about the future. Maybe this fixation with showrooms is just another example of that. The existing players know the most about the past, and they find it very, very difficult to let go of the past. Just because you know the most about the past does not mean that they know the most about the future. So respect your competitors. I love our competitors. I respect our competitors. Competition will make you stronger. It will make you stronger. Respect your competitors. But do not allow ever your competitors, however big they are, to intimidate you. Do not be intimidated by a competitor. I compete against the biggest holding companies in Turkey. I'm a foreigner. I'm an outsider. I know nothing about the used car industry, but I compete with the biggest holding companies in Turkey that all have a used car operation. And we are beating them. We are beating them. So I respect them. They, they have made us stronger, but I am not intimidated by them. You, as a young person entering into the world, trying to disrupt an existing industry, should never be intimidated. If you are intimidated, don't start because you've already lost. If you enter an industry as an outsider, if you enter a category as a disruptor, but you are intimidated, but you are afraid, don't do it. You will fail. It's mental. It's all in your head. So, yes, there is competition, and I respect them, but we're inventing the future. So, my team has just as much of a right on the future as any team. And that's what I believe, and on that basis, I'm very, very optimistic about our future. We have a long, long way to go. We've made great progress, but we have a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, actually, we, are, we have just passed our time, but if you have... Sure, five. Yeah, I, I will have one more question, and then we will call today. So we have already talked And about if anybody here has questions. Uh, okay, so as long as you have... Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. please, okay. of course. So, so we have already talked about your professional life, your, how you ended up uh, with the Wawa cars, and your approach to business. But as an individual, as a person, Lawrence Merritt, Huh. How do you deal uh, with burnouts or how do you motivate yourself because you need to be check of all trades to keep everything in uh, order and you have those operations dealing with lots of people yes. uh, and you have connections in UK. So how do you uh, deal with that? The mission, the mission has to really matter. The mission has to really matter. You know, one of the reasons why I, I also uh, failed at TagSmart, we were talking about, it didn't matter to me enough, the mission of addressing the problem of fakes and forgeries in the art world. You know, I'm kind of, in a way, ashamed to say it, but it's the truth. I'm not an art world guy. I don't go to art events. I don't have... A, a collection of art in my world, the mission actually just never really mattered enough to me. It didn't matter enough to me. So uh, in order to sustain yourself, to give yourself that fuel, the mission has to really matter. You have to feel that in some small way you are improving the world. You have to believe that you are a positive energy force that has a positive societal impact, that you are making people's lives better, that you are helping people. 
that you are in this aspect of their life providing them with safety, with security, with ease. That's my mission. Yes, I am a used car salesman, but I describe my mission in more meaningful terms because I believe that's true. Buying and selling a car is the single biggest transaction of most people's lives. Allowing them to do it with ease, safety, security matters. I feel it really matters. The more chaos, the more craziness, the more volatility, the more flux, the more our mission matters. At least in this way, we can help people. So this motivates you. This fuels you. The second thing, team, have the right people around you. You know, one of the things that's really, really important to us is, is that we just, you know, we don't hire assholes. <laughs> don't work with assholes. Don't. People say, you know, the technical experience or CV and qualifications and background is the most important thing. It's not. The most important thing is chemistry. Is chemistry, is attitude. Do you enjoy hanging out with this person? Are you happy to spend 12 hours a day in this group of people? Are you happy? Do you like them? People say that liking doesn't matter. What matters is respect. Bullshit. Bullshit. Those people have never created a company. Liking the people that you work with really matters because you're going to be in the trenches with them for 12, 14 hours a day, day after day, month after month, year after year. They will give you energy as you will give them energy. They will help you. They will guide you. They will be your inspiration. You will learn from them. I think the third thing that I would say is hire people that are smarter than you. Hire people that are smarter than you. Now, I reject the jack-of-all-trades description. As a startup founder, you can't just be the jack-of-all-trades. Actually, you have to be the expert of all trades. You have to. You have to understand digital marketing, UI, UX, how to earn the maximum yield on the cash in your bank account. You have to be diverse in a very granular way. Don't create a company if you're not comfortable with details. Don't do it. Don't create a company if you're not comfortable rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty. You have to. You can't outsource that when you are creating a company. You will fail. You have to be intimate with the metrics and the rhythm of the data in your company. When you sit with your marketing people, you have to be familiar with their metrics at least as much as they are. When you sit with your product people, so actually that matters. But you also have to hire people in their function that are smarter than you. That's really important as well. Because then you feel that you are a collective. Then you feel that it, that it is a team. It's not just about you. You know, I, I say to my people, diminish me. <laughs> Make me obsolete. Make me less relevant. The less relevant you become, the stronger your team is. It's a sign of you having hired and developed the best. Be comfortable with that. It's okay. So I think, um, you know, th those would be my uh, advices. And the final thing that I would say is have a partner that is signed up to the mission. When I say partner, I mean husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend because it's not a nine to five. I have four children. Mashallah. <laughs> My wife is a lone parent. She describes herself as a lone parent in London. I come on a Monday, I go back on a Friday, I'm always home for pizza and movies with my children. And then I come back on a Monday. But she's alone, Monday to Friday. But she has signed up to the mission. 
Otherwise, this would be impossible. This would not work. So if you're going to do this, don't just think about your colleagues. Think about the impact that it will have on your partner. Make sure that they sign up to your mission because it's not a nine to five. If you're looking for a nine to five, don't create a company. That's not a value judgment. It's totally fine for people working in a corporate doing a nine to five. But just be clear, that's not startup life. That's not what this is. Uh, so the buy-in of your personal partner is also very, very important. And she is also my fuel. My children are also my fuel. They also encourage, they also support. And that then gives you the energy to keep going. Great. Actually, this has been very inspirational for me. Uh, and I will be definitely watching the recording of this event and taking notes uh, of those key, You're too kind. Uh, uh, key phrases. Uh, and I feel like uh, this talk has been like a short MBA kind of thing. So that have been important lessons. Uh, and thank you for sharing those in a very open manner uh, and uh, being comfortable with your failures and successes. So they are, these are all very important lessons for all of us and for future entrepreneurs. And before we call it a day, if there is any question that the, our audience have? Uh, okay, so do you still have time? Yes. Because <laughs> you... Yeah, let's go for a few minutes. Yes. Okay, yeah, so... Please, there wait. are three or four I'm happy to so answer. So you already yes. asked your first question. Let's uh, hear from them, then we will go with you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for... for thank you. The world is different, maybe, but you said that if you want to be succeed, uh, you do mistake, you mm -hmm. have to be failed. When you said that, I wonder one thing, but please don't say I did do the same. If you have to change the turn back time, what would you do in your life, in your career, and in your uh, company? I wonder that. <coughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a, that, that's a great question. Look, I, I don't, um, I'm going to try and answer that question, but I don't spend too much time thinking about that question. <laughs> and, and the reason why I don't spend, because look, we are all immaculate with hindsight. Everybody is immaculate with hindsight, right? Uh, so instead, when I, when I think about the past, I don't think about, here's what I would do differently. I try to look for the lessons. Uh, because, because the lessons enable you to then have foresight. And that's much more important. Hindsight is less important. Foresight is much more important. So... so I don't really think in terms of, here's what I would do differently. Of course, there are things that I would do differently. There are lessons that I could have learned faster. Let's put it that way. Sometimes I feel that it took me too long to fail. I should have seen it earlier. You know, maybe my tag smart experience is an example. <laughs> you know, I was bashing my head against a brick wall for two and a half years. That's probably too long. You know, getting to product market fit, this thing that startup people talk a lot about. Shouldn't take two and a half years, uh, as an example, right? We should have accepted, we don't have product market fit. Let's give our investors their money back and let's go home and let's do something different, right? But actually, the, 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 the thing to focus on isn't to beat yourself up. Uh, it's not to, you know, be kind on yourself instead. Be kind. Um, there's not enough kindness in this world, be kind, and instead say, okay, here are some really, really important lessons. Uh, and if you view it through that filter, the bigger your failings, the better, uh, because the bigger your failings, the more that you have learned. So instead, I choose to view my background and my history in that way. To answer your question, what would I do differently? Uh, I think I would have bought some Bitcoin in 2010. <laughs> I would certainly have done that differently. And I came across the white paper in 2016. I was about six years too late. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Is there anything else? Yep. Hi. Yeah, please. Uh, you said that you shouldn't be afraid to hire people and let them go if they doesn't fit. Yes. Uh, I wonder if is it uh, creates an anxiety along the team like, uh, yes. be afraid to get hired. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. There is clearly How a can balance. How prevent the team from performing poorly? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And the answer to that question is that you don't decide whether that person fits or not. The team decides. That's the answer. So it's not me. I'm not a monarch. I don't have a corner office <laughs> with, you know, three-inch carpet uh, and doors. You know, our entire office is open plan. I sit on a table in an open plan office alongside everybody else. Uh, and and um, I think one of the positive features about our company that is different, let's say, to a traditional company is that we are non-hierarchical. There's no boss man culture. No boss man culture. So uh, decision making is entirely distributed. Uh, people are empowered. People have agency. And it's really, really important because you want people to feel that they own the company. You want that. So everybody in our company must feel like a co-owner. We enable that. I enable that because everybody in my company has stock options in Vavakas. Everyone. So they are co-owners of the company. Um, so with that setup, with that structure, you are able to allow decision making to exist in a very distributed way. Uh, and so to answer your question very specifically, if someone comes into the team and the team decides this person doesn't fit, doesn't fit on mission, doesn't fit on culture, then my role in that is to just say, okay. My role is not to make that decision for my team. Uh, look, I think if you are serious about culture, you have to hire for culture and you have to fire for culture. If you don't fire for culture, nobody takes your culture seriously. Uh, the other final point that I would make very quickly is that smart people, if you want to hire the best people, if you want to hire smart people, you have to be, let's say, this way. You can't allow mediocre people that lower the bar to survive in your company. Because if you do that, you suffer regression and the regression eventually will kill your company. Thank you for your question. Hi, uh, my name is Arda and I want to... Uh, you talked about exposing ourselves and learning new topics like uh, finance, economy, technology, or uh, marketing or sales. Uh, about dividing our energy, energy to different areas, uh, wouldn't it stop uh, us mastering on one main subject? Uh, how did you deal with this time and energy management back then? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think if you want to be a founder, you have to develop that expertise in all of those areas. Um, you can't just stay to your superpower and delegate or abdicate all of those other functional areas. So you have to have opinion about every subject? You have to. Okay, I get it. And it's okay to learn on the job. So if you're a founder, if you're 23 years old, if you're 24 years old and you've decided to go out there and create your own company and your superpower, let's say, is programming, you're a developer, you're a technologist, fantastic. But when you start hiring people, you need to learn the skill set of managing people, leading people, HR. And if you then are having a product or a service that you need to sell, whether it's a SaaS business, a B2B business, a consumer business, you need to learn about sales. You need to learn about marketing. And if you have a platform where people come and buy your product, you have to learn about product, UI, UX, conversion rate optimization. You have to become expert at Google Analytics. So my, my only advice to you is that that's going to be your reality. Embrace it. You can't just have a superpower and say, I will stick to this domain and abdicate or outsource responsibility of all of those other domains to my colleagues because then you're effectively outsourcing the success of your company. It's too important, no? So with time, try and develop an opinion, try and learn about all of those adjacent categories. You'll do it by, 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 by learning you can also do it by having mentors. You can also do it by accessing all of the amazing content on YouTube. I mean, it's, there's really no reason for you not to know a little bit. 
I would encourage you to embrace that. I have another, another question. Uh, what do you think about Turkish people's trust issue uh, about buying used cars? For example, I just witnessed that problem. Uh, my uncle uh, considered buying a car from online, uh, from Baba Cars. Yeah. And uh, th his friends convinced him not to because uh, they told him, uh, for example, it might has a damage uh, and they store and out of record. And uh, local mechanics can do that. And it would be hard to understand the difference between the original one and uh, the change door. Yeah. So what do you think about creating and maintaining a trust as a company? Sure, it's a great point, and that's the challenge that we face. So everyone wants to you know, create a brand that people trust. I have to do that. We have to create a brand that people trust. That bit is obvious. Our approach to doing that is what matters, and our approach is about being radically transparent. We're radically transparent. So if you go and look at the, any one of the 400 cars that are listed on my website right now, I give you an expertise report about each of those cars that means your online viewing experience of that car will be better than the physical viewing experience your uncle will have if he visits any showroom in Turkey. So that's how we are trying. I show you every scratch, every dent. I give you a level of transparency about the cars that we sell that is impossible for any physical dealer to provide. Now, clearly it takes time for that to be understood and it takes time for people to become comfortable with that. We've been selling cars online to consumers for 15 months. We sell more cars to more consumers than anyone in Turkey today but we are still on a journey. It still feels like the very beginning and we still have these trust issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I think the product experience that provides the transparency is critical and then the positive word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So if your uncle had come across someone that had interacted with Vava cars and told him, no, it's brilliant, it's this or that, maybe that would have convinced him. It sounds like he came across people that told him not to do it and that convinced him. Maybe you should give me his phone number, I'll call him. <laughs> he already bought the car, but uh, next time I would. <laughs> next time, please. And, uh, why Thank you. you. Why did you choose Petrol Officer for cooperation? Or so, what's the important thing while choosing a company? So the founder, <laughs> founding investor, the, I, I have time for one more if that's okay. Okay, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, the founding investor of Ava Cars, the company that gave us our seed funding, owned Petrol Efisi. So that's why we chose Petrol Efisi, because Petrol Efisi is the number one consumer retail brand in Turkey. It has the biggest network, um, and everybody trusts Petrol Efisi. So going back to your question, we knew that for people to become comfortable transferring 400,000 lira online and buying that car into our bank account and then praying and hoping we deliver the car that we don't run off <laughs> and that the car is in the very best condition or the condition that we've described, that's a huge level of trust, right, that I'm asking for. So one of the other ways that we were able to create trust in the Vava Cars brand is through this association. It really helped us enormously. Thank you for your question. I have time for okay. one more, please. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hanan. So the question I wanted to ask you was, to do with when you mentioned creating a team, what would you say is like the minimum number of team members you need to kickstart your startup company? Yeah, that's a great question. I, there's no one size fits all answer to that. It really depends on the context, depends on what you're trying to do, depends on the industry, depends on all of those things. I wouldn't focus so much on the minimum number. Um, I would focus instead on what I described, having people that share the passion. So it has to be meaningful for them. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this guy, Simon, Simon Sinek, and the power of why. That, that, that guy has you know, colonized all of our minds yeah. in the startup world, right? It's not what you do, it's not how you do it. Why you are doing it is really, really important. 
So that's really, really important. Finding people that share your why. Finding people that you get on with. The chemistry is really, really important. And finding people that are not like you in terms of their skill set. I, I would just, I would stick to that as a format. As a, is that two people? Is that three people? Is that four people? I mean, I think when it comes to founders and co-founders, it should be tight. But then, of course, there's an extension of that as your leadership team. There are two co-founders in my company. I'm one of them. But I have a leadership team of C-level executives. And they are just like a co-founder. They just came later on the journey. Uh, and for that reason, they may not have the word co-founder in their job title, but effectively, they're co-founders, right? Um, that would be my advice. I hope that's useful. Thank you very much for your question. So, Lawrence, thank you very much for uh, taking your time. And we have already excess of 30 minutes. Uh, I guess we are uh, some of, have we will to. have some people <laughs> with your schedule uh, who will be on a fit. So thank you for taking your time and uh, traveling uh, right into Ozean University campus. Uh, and thank you all for your questions and comments and being with us here today. Uh, we, will, uh, we look forward to seeing you among us in our future activities. And we, we are looking forward to hear more of Vavakars. Baba in cars. Turkish market. <laughs> Anyone so wants much. to buy or sell a car, Baba car. Thank, you so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And here.